and the colonoscopy found I had a large tumor almost obstructing my colon. Just had some mild symptoms that most of the time I was ignoring. It wasn't until I had blood in my stool that I realized something might be wrong. And so from that point, my life was totally turned upside down. I remember it was really difficult, like looking at the statistics because um, I was really big on those because being in nursing school and um, it was like 69% chance of living for five years. And I, I looked at that as like, I have a 30% chance of dying. When I first met her in the hospital, I remember how young she was. They actually showed me the pictures from the colonoscopy and I said, this is cancer. We did the procedure through three little trocar sites, you know, two of them the diameter of a number two yellow pencil. Everything went very well. She was out of the hospital in about three days. She was up and moving. By the time we left the hospital, she didn't leave in a wheelchair or anything like that. <laughs> From having the minimally invasive surgery, I felt that I was able to, he like, be healed and feel like myself again. I was back in school, taking the stairs in the subway within two weeks. So there's my scar, my itty bitty scar. I was taken down to the ER and they did a CAT scan that showed that my bowel had twisted and they told me you're going to require surgery and it's going to be open. This was when I would just had gotten home. I couldn't, you know, do any type of lifting, like going to get groceries. I couldn't do any of that because I just always had this fear that something was going to just open up, which in fact it did. And then this is once the incision opened up. And when I woke up, I quickly realized that it was a lot more painful. <laughs> when I got home, I expected that I would follow the same path as the minimally invasive surgery. And in no time, I'd be back at the gym and back, you know, running. But I quickly realized that wasn't the case. And I definitely felt depressed. I couldn't get back to feeling like myself again. I would honestly say out of all of the stuff I went through with my cancer, including chemo, that was one of the hardest parts was having to heal up from that surgery. There's no question that if you have the ability to do minimally invasive surgery, you should consider it. Less pain medication, shorter hospitalizations, and overall much shorter recovery time. I think you're a little higher in the, in the stud department. I would never say I'm thankful for having cancer, but I'm thankful for the perspective it gave me. The whole experience has just helped us to just always try and find the good in life and just stay positive. Hi everyone. Um, I think that was an incredible story uh, about Brittany's life journey on getting minimally invasive surgery and going back to open surgery and the challenges she faced. Um, I think today's topic sort of talks about minimally invasive surgery and uh, why we are here today, especially with the pandemic at hand. Um, there's a lot for us to think through. Um, we have a exciting um, hour and a half for you and it's important that we're all, we all understand uh, the importance of minimally invasive surgery. And we will also want to know, is this a, a impossible mission or can this be made in a safe and effective way um, during the COVID or post COVID? Um, with that, um, we have a housekeeping rule slide uh, that's up there. So please take a look at it. Um, feel free to ask any questions you may have in the, in the chat window. Um, we will have some uh, polling questions and Hopefully, you will also have a Q&A after the panel discussion. Um, with that, I actually would like to introduce um, Dr. Uh, Salvador Morales uh, for joining us uh, here. He is the panel moderator. Uh, Dr. Salvador, thank you for joining. Um, he is the Chief of Unit of Innovation and Minimally Invasive Surgery uh, at the University Hospital um, in, in Spain. Um, also the uh, President-elect of the EAES Society. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Morales, over to you. Thank you, Nitya. Um, thank you for the invitation. 
It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I hope this, I'm sure that during this uh, one hour and a half, we will have a nice uh, panel di uh, discussion with the panelists and with all of you that are connected. Well connected. I, it's, um, I think it's important to analyze what, what's going on in the world and the pandemic is really changing our life. And I think it's important this type of initiative from, from Medtronic and supported also by the IRCAT uh, to see how to deal with minimal invasive during the pandemic. I think the situation worldwide is changing. Uh, one day in Spain, we are in a good position, but you are in Spain and in Lerida, for example, in, a, in the north of Spain, situation changed rapidly. So we have to be prepared as a surgeon to face this, uh, this pandemic. You know exactly how these uh, have gone. Uh, regarding what is in the literature, Everything is starting in Wuhan, you know that, and in November, um, but in just one month, we got uh, 60 cases confirmed in China, but suddenly, little by little, the number of cases starts increasing worldwide. You see that in May 5th, we had 3 million, more than 3 million people infected uh, around the world, but just uh, um, one month later, we have 10 millions, and if we look at the data from July 1st to July 9th, we increased the number in almost 2 million. So that means that the pandemic is still on. You can think in some places of uh, Europe, China, uh, that everything is over, but it's not over. And it's spreading around the world. And it's coming back uh, in some places, like in the north of Spain, in some uh, um, population of 200,000 people is, uh, is back. And they're having problems to operate the patient again. So we have to be prepared. We have to know what we have learned. Uh, but the question is, and, and my friends that are not doctors ask me all the time, if I thought that this will, could happen. And it's important to see what's going on uh, and what happened in the past. And you see that this guy, Bill Gates, in 2015, he pointed out in one of his conference, in his lectures, that we were too worried about mi missiles and uh, having a war. But the problem was uh, virus and bacteria around the world, and we were not doing nothing. We were doing nothing against them. And he mentioned that if some, uh, something could uh, kill uh, more than uh, one million people in a short period of time, it was not going to be a war; that it was going to be an epidemic. And the problem is that if you see the amount of money that we are investing in 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 this is uh, not enough. There is not enough epidemiologists and enough doctors in 2015 to face what is being happening. And that's true, and we've seen it. We were not ready for this pandemic around the world. So this pandemic have changed a lot of things, have changed our priorities. Uh, today, we were, were thinking in our houses in many places to have a nice summer in, in, in Europe. Uh, going to the beach, going to Palma de Mallorca, maybe with a nice car. But today, what we want is to have a good mask that uh, everybody in our family is safe. Also, the human relationship have changed. We have to maintain this uh, distance, and it's difficult for us. It's difficult in our daily life. Uh, we are, I'm Latin, I'm Mediterranean. I'm used to hug and to kiss my friends. And, and now it's difficult to maintain this distance. And even when you operate a patient, I have to say like yesterday, like I was operating a, a gastric cancer and I couldn't do anything for the patient and getting out and talking to the family and be able to tell them without maintaining the distance that I couldn't do anything. I have to tell that as a doctor is difficult for me. And hospital have changed. Uh, we have taken in our hospital too many measure, measure. You see, this is where uh, was our intensive care unit uh, before the pandemic in December, everybody was moving around without any problem. Now we keep uh, the distance in our hospital, we keep the mask and we keep the glasses during surgery. And this also have changed. Uh, surgeons have changed in a way because we were operating in a standard and conventional way, but today we haven't got to this point, but sometimes we have to share where these difficult uh, mask, face chill, that really give us a, a difficulties during our surgery. So we have to be ready to operate with this protection because we need it. 
So with this introduction, I would like you that are connected to answer a uh, two pulling question that we are going to have it. The first one just to know is how many minimal invasive procedure, what is the volume that you perform uh, daily, uh, an, uh, annually in your, in your center? So please uh, fill the, uh, the pull question. So this is just to know exactly how many procedures you perform uh, annually in your center. We're going to move to the pulling question two because we want to know uh, basically your, your, your SWIP speciality in surgery. In this one, you can see what is your minimal invasive surgery specialization just general surgery, upper GI, hernia surgery, bariatric colorectal, or if you're doing thoracic, HBP, gynecology, surologies, or other. Basically, what is your main field is what we want to know. So we can show the data of this, uh, the results. You see that uh, mostly there are general surgery who face all the spe uh, sub-speciality. Um, based on sub-speciality, there is mostly colorectal surgeons and upper GI. So that's good to know, to know exactly how to face the, this uh, discussion. So today, during this, during this session, we are going to have the chance to have three excellent panelists to discuss about everything that we are facing during, uh, during a pandemic. And the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to introduce the three panelists and I would like them uh, to give an, an overview of what uh, they have lived in their centers and in their cities, to know exactly in the situation. And so we are able to understand better that answer when they, when they come to the discussion. The first one will be Tom Cecil from the UK he is the clinical director of Peritoneal Malignancy Institute. Um, he is mostly involved in colorectal surgery, if I'm right. And I would like to uh, give the, uh, the, the panel to Tom during the last, next uh, one to three minutes to explain the situation in UK so we know exactly how, uh, he's, facing, how he's facing in hospital the situation. So please, Tom. Uh, th thank you, Salva. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for Medtronic for putting on this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Tom Cecil. I'm a colorectal surgeon. I'm the clinical director of the Peritoneal Malignancy Institute in Basingstoke. And we're also one of the LAPCO National Training Centres for Laparoscopic Surgery in the UK. The, uh, the NHS, uh, we have a national health service in, in the UK. And, and COVID-19 came to the UK a bit later than Italy and Spain. And we uh, started preparing for what might come. And we have, one, we, we have one of the lower numbers of intensive care beds in the UK. So a lot of preparation was put into uh, increasing the number of ITU beds. And at the beginning of March, in, in my hospital, all elective surgery, and really across the UK, all elective surgery stopped in hospitals that had emergency uh, uh, patients coming into it so we could prepare to use our theatres and the ventilators in theatres uh, for patients. Uh, and we uh, stopped operating for six weeks. We did no elective cancer surgery at all, which was sort of devastating for the patients who were all waiting for, for surgery. In, in April, we've been able to restart uh, surgery, but we are still operating at much less capacity than we normally would. Uh, and, and our National Health, Health Service has taken over the private hospitals to try and provide safe areas uh, to do the, do the surgery. We had, we've had some guidelines that were issued from our Association of Coloproctology, and I don't know whether I can share this screen with you, whether this is coming up, but this was a, a very straightforward little uh, uh, prioritization that we would focus on the, uh, the priority for the patient, the P-score of how quickly we thought they needed surgery, the vulnerability of the patient in terms of their risk from coming into uh, 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 contact with COVID, and then the environment that we could provide them with. 
uh, whether it was a, an area free of COVID, such as in our private hospitals, uh, or whether this was areas where there was a high risk of uh, contacting COVID, a preoperative pathway. And then we very much focus on things like joint surgeon operating. There was talk of avoiding lapros laparoscopic surgery to begin with, which we did a little bit of, but very quickly we felt that laparoscopy would be safe provided we took some precautions uh, um, and doing things such as a CT and a COVID swab on all the patients. So we have got back operating in the UK, but at a, a, a lower level than we were pre-COVID and it still remains a challenge. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Will you stop sharing? Yeah. Okay, our, our next panelist will be, oh, sorry. Dr. Chukri, he, he's from Egypt, from El Cairo, and he's the head of oncological surgery. And the importance of Dr. Chukri is that he will give an overview of all oncological procedure, and he also have experience, he's a colorectal surgeon also, but he also have experience in gynecology and neurology. So he have a wide uh, vision of, what's, uh, of how to deal with this pandemic, and it will be very interesting his, um, his opinion during, during the, the panel discussion. So I will give you um, uh, the chance to explain what is the situation in Egypt and in Al Qaeda uh, during these last three months and how is the situation right now. So uh, please, Dr. Shukri. Thank you very much, Dr. Morales. Uh, hello, everybody. I thank uh, Irkad and uh, Medtronic for this uh, opportunity uh, to give uh, have an overall idea about what is happening in a uh, uh, northern African country like uh, Egypt, a, a population of uh, more than 100 million uh, persons in a healthcare uh, system that is uh, really uh, not having all the facilities like uh, the European and uh, the US uh, healthcare systems. So. Uh, we were a little bit lucky in uh, our part of the world that uh, the pandemic uh, hit our country a little bit uh, later than uh, Spain, Italy, Germany, uh, and even uh, Britain, which uh, was involved a little bit later, and uh, the US. So we had uh, more or less uh, a good chance to observe what these healthcare systems did and learn from them and try to prepare for the worst. Uh, I live in uh, Cairo. I am practicing in an oncology center, a tertiary care center. So I'm not a front uh, line uh, person who is uh, battling uh, COVID like many of my colleagues are. But uh, I can give you a very good perspective about uh, how can we manage oncology patients in this uh, pandemic? Because at the beginning, there was a big scare about uh, treating anybody uh, during this area, uh, the time frame of the pandemic itself. And we were guided by uh, the, the uh, Royal College uh, of England uh, guidelines and the SAGES guidelines uh, and many other societies guidelines that they trying to defer treating oncology patients. And if you can give the patient uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, for example, and deferred their uh, surgery a little bit. But this is uh, really, uh, it, it, it is not, uh, to me, a very practical uh, way of handling things. If you are a dedicated cancer center, as I am uh, working in a, in a purely dedicated cancer center, work has been uh, going on uh, very routinely in our center from day one and until uh, today. We are practicing what we uh, used to practice. We are uh, operating everybody. We are not delaying anybody. But this is a privilege because we are a dedicated cancer center. But if, if you have a general hospital, for example, they are hit hard and there are a lot of hospitals that uh, were converted to a COVID uh, exclusive uh, hospitals. So these uh, hospitals, they have to uh, shift their patients somewhere else. And we had a big problem 
uh, around two months ago, where uh, the National Cancer Institute shut down because there was an outbreak of COVID cases in the National Cancer Institute. So we had to uh, treat all the cancer patients instead of them. They were referred to many other uh, cancer centers. So in, in overall, uh, we are still doing a good job in spite of the pandemic. I still uh, operate almost every day since the beginning of the pandemic, taking all the precautions, of course, as we are going to discuss uh, during this uh, webinar. And I hope uh, we can go back to normality uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chukri, for your analysis of the situation. For sure, it will be very, very interesting to know because you it seems that you haven't started um, operating and uh, that's important that, uh, to see how you did it and how you face this, this situation. So our next, our next panelist will be Milos uh, Belovic. Uh, he's from Serbia. He's the head of the Department uh, for Minimal Invasive Surgery in the University Hospital in, in Serbia, in Belgrade. And he will give an overview of the situation in this uh, part of Europe. So please, Milos, uh, tell us what, what is the situation now in your in your area. Thank you, Salvan. First of all, I want to thank guys from Medtronic and IRCAD for the opportunity to, to talk about situation in this part of the world. I'm from Belgrade, Serbia. Serbia is situated in Southeast Europe with a population of slightly below 7 million people. In 2017, total health expenditure accounted for around 9% of GDP, which is not low, but when you translate it to US dollars, it's only 1.3 thousand US dollars per capita. The number of physicians and nurses per 100,000 inhabitants increased in past two decades, and this increase is in line with other neighboring countries, but way below, of course, the average of the European Union. Another issue is that the distribution of health care professionals is unequal across the country, and there is shortage of some specialties like anesthesiologists. Healthcare is organized in three levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary level. Tertiary care is the most specialized, uh, care is the most specialized personnel and technological equipment. I personally work in a tertiary care institution, University Hospital for Digestive Surgery. It is a part of clinical center of Serbia. It is the biggest institution in the region and backbone of the healthcare system in the country. It consists of 41 organizational units, out of which 23 are hospitals. The complex also houses the Faculty of Medicine. The Clinical Center of Serbia has more than 3.1 thousand beds and 7.3 thousand employees. Regarding the COVID situation, we are in the second peak of epidemic. When you look at the official numbers, trend is still increasing. It seems that current situation, the field is significantly worse than official numbers can project. In the capital, secondary level hospitals were recently rapidly transformed into the COVID hospitals, while clinical center of Serbia uh, as a tertiary hospital is trying to stay COVID free and carry on with elective treatment. The health system's administrative structure is here characterized by the centralized state governance. Depending on the current epidemiological situation in the country, in the region, not in the hospital, because we are like uh, in, in Egypt, uh, dedicated to treat uh, oncological patients, we are asked to adjust the operating schedule in respect both to caseload and pathology. Situation depends on the level of alert in which population is, but at the moment, caseload is reduced to 30% of a caseload under conventional circumstances, and we are allowed to operate only oncological patients. In the private setting, situation is, is quite different. It, had, it has developed without much control or state support, and private hospitals follow its own regulation. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Milos. From what it's true, that is going to be a very interesting discussion because we're facing different situations with the different panelists. 
and that will give us a better overview of, of, the, of the situation and what to do and give the proper advice. So uh, talking about changes, uh, one of the changes that have been on the air uh, uh, is uh, what about laparoscopy? And in fact, if I'm not wrong, Tom, uh, uh, in, the, in the first recommendation from the uh, Association of Laparoscopic Surgeon of Great Britain and Ireland at the beginning was not to do laparoscopy. And then uh, they came later with that. Uh, they, uh, they, they came uh, saying that, yes, uh, go for laparoscopy. That was the, what happened in the UK, right, uh, Tom? Uh, that that, 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 that's correct. That the first guidance was to to, the, to avoid laparoscopy, and then they changed that a month later. I think as we got more feedback from Italy and Spain, the people were doing this, and it appeared to be safe. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, I'm gonna yeah, in fact, I'm gonna give you some some data. What happened? Uh, these recommendations come from the UK. Uh, make us move uh, in the EIS together with Sages, and we say, um, come on. I mean, there is no reason today. Uh, to a stop, uh, to give a recommendation to stop laparoscopy it took us like 20 years uh, to say go ahead with laparoscopic procedure, and now uh, 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 and now we shouldn't stop just because we think is not good without evidence. And in fact, I have to say that the 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 UK uh, the Society of Laparoscopic Surgeons of UK in an island uh, um, a week later, as Tom said. Uh, uh, they change the recommendation to say there is no evidence and you have to balance between the risk of the patient. And I'm going to tell you why um, these come out. Uh, and the reason is I will give you an overview of, of the reason why they came with this recommendation and what is the fear of uh, surgeons about laparoscopy. You know that COVID-19 is a respiratory pathogen. And if you analyze where this virus has been detected, it's been detected in the upper and the lower respiratory tract. And you know exactly that uh, during this uh, respiratory uh, movement, uh, you create these uh, water droplets uh, that goes to the hand, goes to the surface. And that's the reason why it is recommended uh, to wash your hand. And also, but also it's been detected that produce aerosol. And that's the reason why it is recommended to use a mask. So the problem of aerosol is when you operate that we have aerosol coming from the pneumoperitoneum. And that's the reason why we were a little bit, uh, uh, um, we, we have a lot of discussion if these aerosol can contain some virus and be infectious. The aerosol from pneumoperitoneum, we have to analyze. Maybe it comes from five, uh, uh, as a surgeon, as a general surgeon, I can say that it comes from five, fine origin. One is the surgical smoke uh, produced by the, by the instrument, the, by the energy, the tools, when you open the colon or you open, the, uh, you open any, any viscera, the vial, the blood, or the peritoneal fluid. And I'll give you an overview about, about all of this. If you analyze surgical smoke and we, what we know about from other virus, everything and all the fear that it was in said in the literature and all the discussion was coming basically from the papilloma virus. If you analyze what happened with the papilloma virus and there was literature describing some infections of the respiratory tract by gynecologists and uh, nurses in the operating room. And there was a high risk when you uh, operate this papilloma virus of this surgical smoke infect, infecting the uh, the the uh, professional uh, health uh, the health professional in the in the operating room. So basically, that comes from here. But you have to know that when you operate a papilloma virus, you hit with the uh, cautery directly the area of the virus, and it's totally different setting. So everything comes from here. But let's move, let's move to other virus, not the papilloma. Let's go to bloodborne virus pathogens. And what we know from there is that these bloodborne uh, virals has been detected in the surgical plume, but there is no evidence of increasing the risk of transmission. One thing is that you detect the virus and the other thing is you detect someone who get infected due to see surgical smoke. In fact, there is no documentation telling that there, is, there has been a transmission from surgical smoke or laparoscopic pneumoperitoneum of these virus, like uh, HIV 
or uh, the hepatitis. And in, fla in fact, it is recommended to uh, do laparoscopy because you have a better control of the, um, of the contamination of transmission than during open surgery. So this is uh, information coming from bloodborne virus, but what about other respiratory virus? And you see the SARS or the MERS have not shown evidence of disease transmission to other coronavirus in the past. So uh, today, as with this uh, coronavirus that we're facing today also, there is no uh, information about infection in this sense. So we can come, we can come to the conclusion, conclusion the, in the aerosol from pneumoperitoneal during the pandemic, other virus have been found, but they're not infected, except papillomavirus, but the treatment of this papillomavirus is different. And the SARS-CoV-2 have not found. What about stools? Regarding the stools, uh, we know that this virus, the virus that produced this pandemic, has the ACI uh, um, attached to the ACIE to receptors in the body of the patients. And these receptors are in the gastric, duodenal, jejunal, colonic, and rectal cells. So that means that this virus is attracted to this uh, area of the body of the patient. So that's the reason why it has been found RNA of the of vital RNA in the stools of the patient. And that's the reason why there is a speculation about fecal oral uh, transmission of this virus because with the SARS, we identify this route of transmission. So the question was that until few uh, uh, days ago, there was in the stools of the patient, it was detected just RNA, no the virus. And what I mean with this is that sometimes you can have a PCR positive that means that, that, the, that the virus, the RNA of the patient is present, but this doesn't mean that the virus is present. And this is something that you consider, you have to think. Sometimes there is some patient that still the PCR is positive during a period of time, but they are not infectious because the virus is not detected. And this is very important information. But I can tell you that in this last paper just published, it was detected not only the viral RNA, but it was also, also isolate the virus itself. So now today we can say that even we know some information that oral fecal transmission with oral respiratory and coronavirus, the RNA of the patient uh, A have been found and also virus itself have been found. And that's the reason there is a possibility of transmission. And that gives you the idea that be aware about dealing with you do an anastomosis and you open the bowel. What about blood? Blood, uh, this virus has been uh, not transmitted by blood. And the current literature show you, show you that in blood or urine, uh, have not has been detected the virus, but only in very clinical severe cases. So I can say today that other respiratory virus have not been described to be transmitted through blood, only have found RNA in severe cases. And these cases usually is because the patient is doing really bad and they don't undergo surgery. What about bile? Bile, there is no uh, information about detecting in bile uh, the, uh, this virus. So we safe to do hepatic surgery and safe to do a cholecystectomy based on the literature. So in vi uh, these virus have not been detected in this area of the body. And the other question is peritoneal fluid. This paper from Pisa, Italy, came and created like a bit, like a earthquake in the in the in the in the literature because they were saying that it, it was present in the peritoneal fluid but i would not accept of a reviewer a paper saying this that sarcov 2 is present in the peritoneal fluid because if you heard here uh, the vi the virus itself was not detected what was detected was the rna and i told you already that detecting their rna doesn't mean that the virus is there and could be transmitted. 
So you see that they found the RNA, they didn't found uh, the virus, so there is doubt of transmission. So this is what we have. Uh, based on the literature and based on the evidence, the only possibility is maybe the stools of the patient and when you open the bowel. But still, there are some concerns, and that's the reason why we are here today, and we are going to discuss about this. And this is the first question that I come to the panelists, is uh, should we perform based on this information laparoscopy during this time? And in case we do, how do we do this safely? So I would like to, to come with these uh, uh, questions, and I would like the panelists to give their opinion in this sense. So let's start, for example, from Tom that uh, opened the discussion before about the recommendation coming from the from the Great Britain uh, Society. So, so I, th I think that the what the association put out was recommendations, but as I mentioned, a lot, lots of us had already started returning to surgery and had made the decision that we would do laparoscopic surgery. I think they're different situations. So there's the emergency unscreened patients who are coming in as, as emergency patients. And should we do laparoscopic appendicectomies? Should we do laparoscopy for perforated uh, uh, ulcers and diverticular disease? There was a lot of late presentation of disease as well. A lot of query appendicitis were treated in the community with antibiotics. People didn't want to come into hospital. So I think, I think that the the approach we took in our unit is we would do what we thought was the most straightforward and sensible to, to give the patient the best chance of a good outcome as quickly as possible. Uh, and we would we were keen that they got better and they left hospital as quickly as and safely as possible. And if we felt that laparoscopy was the, the right route for that, we would do it. Probably where we didn't do laparoscopy was perhaps the, the complex, difficult cases where where some, some of my more senior colleagues would say it was a, a triumph of common sense over technology, or technology over common sense, where we were, uh, where we might spend hours doing a difficult case, which might be done quicker open. Uh, but so we didn't certainly abandon laparoscopy, but we tailored it to the, to the patient. And then but I think that was very much reinforced by the guidance changing that, 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 that supported what our approach had been. So that, that would be uh, the first question. The, the, Dr. Chukri, do you stop laparoscopy anytime or do you have any doubts during this pandemic about stopping uh, laparoscopy? Well, uh, um, uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, our practice in, in the oncology center uh, in most of the GI uh, tumors and, and a lot of urological and uh, gynecological tumors as well, we perform like 95% of the cases uh, laparoscopically. This is the tradition. And, and uh, when this uh, COVID uh, pandemic started, we, we had a very deep discussion and we reviewed all the data coming from Spain, Italy, uh, the US, Britain. And, and uh, I, I really couldn't find anything that is compelling to stop laparoscopy at all, especially that I am a tertiary care center. I am only dealing with cancer patients and I can uh, select the patients very well if I'm suspicious of uh, any patient who, who's having uh, COVID-19, I can postpone him for a couple of weeks and then bring him back. So we had the leisure of, of, of scrutinizing our patients well and uh, we are not really uh, stressed as regard uh, OR times and uh, availability of staffing and uh, all the other issues that uh, general hospitals uh, dealing with COVID patients have. So from day one, I, I decided to continue on doing what we were doing, but more carefully, taking care of the staff, taking care of ourselves, and taking care of, uh, most importantly, the patient himself. We do not want the patient to have COVID uh, and come into the hospital and, and bring COVID w with him or her. And we did not want to uh, have a, a non-COVID patient contracting COVID in the hospital uh, while being malignant patient, a post-operative patient, maybe having pre-operative uh, chemotherapy uh, with some immune suppression uh, element as well. So. Uh, we continue doing laparoscopy 
And I, I might remind you that uh, I come from a country with uh, an endemic uh, hepatitis situation, hepatitis C. Uh, we, we have like 20% of the population having hepatitis C before we started our national campaign of, of uh, Sovaldi treatment for, for the all, all hepatitis C positive patients. So we, we, we are used to uh, the fact that we are operating in a high-risk environment and uh, with, with a lot of uh, viruses and uh, possibility of contracting infection. But I would never deny a, a, a laparoscopic procedure for a patient when indicated just for the fear of uh, the COVID. And we have absolutely no shred of scientific evidence that this harms the patient or the staff in any way. So this, this is our situation. And in Serbia, Dr. Velovic, uh, uh, did you stop uh, laparoscopy any time? Uh, I personally did not. Okay. I'm head of the Department for Minimal Invasive Upper GI Surgery. Um, I was a bit confused with first uh, uh, recommendations that laparoscopy should be put under question mark, should be stopped. But when I'm uh, in, in awkward situation, I go back to basics. When I was in high school, I, I studied chemistry and physics. And first thing that uh, I, I uh, questioned what, what, was what's, what's aerosol? And then according to Cambridge Dictionary, aerosol is a mixture of particles and liquid or gas that uh, are contained in. And you can find virus in aerosol, but Without electrosurgical devices, the ability of carbon dioxide to aerosolize particles in the abdomen is unknown, but probably almost negligible. But with electrosurgical use, uh, both in open surgery and minimal invasive surgery, uh, we can find aerosolization of or uh, generation of particles and hence the po possible risk of viral emission. Was the fear with uh, pneumoperitoneum and, and minimal invasive surgery? It's low gas mobility. It's uh, fear that aerosol concentrates in the abdominal cavity and the concentration depends on pressure of the CO2 or pneumoperitoneum size. And it's a fear of sudden release of, of, of gas with particles in the operating theater. As you said, viral emission with SARS-CoV-2 virus in laparoscopy is uh, studied uh, ju just in, uh, in small parts. Uh, it's not well studied, but uh, we have data about hepatitis, hepatitis B virus and human papilloma virus, but there is no uh, evidence that uh, this aerosol, which does exist in the sur surgical smoke, is infectious for surgeons. No evidence does not mean that it, it does not exist, uh, but erring on the side of safety would warrant treating the coronavirus as exhibiting similar aerosol aerosolization properties. Uh, in, in conclusion, much is unknown, but nevertheless, precautions should be taken. But that, that's one of the things that I want to bring, Milos, because uh, and I will uh, ask the three panelists. Based on the literature and based on what I explained, do you face different if you're performing a surgery, a minimal invasive surgery, if you are doing a conventional cholestectomy after the evidence in which there is no problem related to bile or uh, inguinal hernia repair by laparoscopy, or you are doing a colorectal procedure which are open the, the colon, and we know uh, from the literature that could be viral. So should we face this minimal invasive procedure in a different way? I, will, uh, I would like to give your opinion in that sense, uh, the three of you, very quick. I'm personally uh, trying to do uh, the, the, the laparoscopic procedure as safe as is possible. I mean, the use of staplers, laparoscopic staplers allow us to close the bowel uh, and and to, to, to perform minimal contamination. And personally, I do not change procedure during this, this, this uh, COVID pandemic. Dr. Jukre, for you is the same uh, one procedure than the other? You take more precautions if you're doing and if you're open the bowel 
than, for example, I know that it's an oncological center and you're not doing maybe cholecystectomy, but if you were, we will be doing a procedure with no, uh, in which you don't open the bowel, it would be different? Well, well uh, use of staplers now is, is like uh, a <laughs> thing that is, a, is a, co a common sense thing. Everybody's using staplers. So really the contamination uh, by uh, uh, intestinal contents is, is really, uh, really low. And, and uh, if, you, if you now know that uh, the intestinal contents uh, is, is the potential risk of transmission, so it will be uh, more, more careful than usual. But I, I think that the very basic, very regular rules of infection control, uh, just to, to, to have goggles to, uh, or face shields and, and, uh, and a simple 95 mask or, uh, or any, any of the very basic uh, things that we are doing uh, regularly, it will be enough. Well, I, I don't think that we need to do any an extravagant thing for laparoscopy. So, for example, Tom, uh, do you think like, uh, do, will you change if you are used in a right column to do an intracorporeal anastomosis, you will stop doing that because this possibility during the pandemic? No, we, we haven't changed our practice. And we also, because of our peritoneal malignancy work, do a lot of open surgery. So we're doing a lot of hand-sewn anastomosis, uh, and so we, we haven't changed our practice. Uh, and I think the only caution I think we need to put out there as surgeons is unfortunately across Europe, we've all lost colleagues who have died from this. And certainly in the UK, there seems to be a disproportionate amount of surgeons who've been affected by this. And our intensive care colleagues who probably have a slightly different attitude to risk than us have, been on the front line and managed to protect themselves well. And as surgeons, I think we are sometimes natural risk takers in terms of that's what we do, isn't it? We, we gamble on anastomosis and with our patients, we try and help them with their operations and the risks we take. And so I, I, I think we're getting more and more relaxed as, we, as, our, our, as we're having less cases in the country, but we, you know, we do need to stay focused, I think, on there is a risk from this and risks to our patients if they catch it. And as we are, are going out more ourselves in the UK now, we can go back to pubs and to restaurants. The worry that as surgeons we might expose ourselves, there is, there is still a risk, isn't there? So I will move with that. Uh, based on that risk, do you filter every surgery? Do you place a filter in a trocar in every surgery? Do you, uh, you, you, uh, you, maybe you were not using that on, on the past and now in the pandemic, for example, in our center, we're filtering, we're using filter in every case. Are you doing that, Tom? Yeah, no, we're not doing that. We, are, we have got some, some uh, um, stacks that will extract the air for us. Uh, um, and but for, for the laparoscopic appendicectomies on call and things, we, we're not, no. You uh, use, uh, and Ahmed, do you use filter? Uh, uh, we, yeah, we we, uh, we use filters uh, at the beginning, especially when uh, the pandemic started and there was a lot of talk about uh, aerosolization and, and uh, the paroscopy and uh, all, all the, the issues. Uh, I was very uh, particular to, to use filters on all cases. Uh, I mandated in, in uh, all the ORs and every case uh, to have filters. Uh, but as Tom said, uh, with time you get, you get things a little bit relaxed when you uh, you find that this is uh, was too much. So now it's it's more or less uh, selective. It's not not uh, routinely used in every uh, case. And especially, I, I found that it is almost impossible to, to collect all the smoke inside the the filter. You, you will have a port that is leaking. You will have. Uh, uh, during interchanging instruments, you will have some uh, leaking. So it, it, it's an impossibility. It's a practical impossibility to prevent smoke release from the uh, pneumoperitoneum to the uh, outside, uh, to, to the room uh, air itself. So uh, we, we tend to uh, use it at first, but now we are using it less and less. And you, Milos, do you use filter in your surgery? Well, uh, like, like Dr. Shukri, 
I mean, uh, we, we are trying to use it as much as we can. But uh, in, in many cases, we fail to, to finish the procedure due to some technical reason uh, using the filter from, from very beginning to, 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 to the very end. Um, and I think it, it would be interesting to, uh, to do the study about uh, aerosolization of the operating theater with filters and with no filters and to see uh, what, what will go, what, what is going on. Yeah, I mean, but you're, technically, you're totally right. It, it, it's uh, it's uh, consensus across all society that filters should be used. As a matter of fact, uh, special filters will ultra low particulate air filtration capabilities. But yet at, at the end of the day, we start with filters and do not end operation with functional filters. It's not but, easy. Yeah, what is true is like, um, I remember when I was um, a resident, I was in the in the US with not uh, supper and after surgery, he used to have a blood test to see how the smoke was affecting him. So I didn't see any uh, much about that until now. Uh, maybe uh, we will see after the pandemic if the filters stayed or not, not just because the virus, just because all the generation of this uh, smoke, but it was true is what Dr. Chukre and you Milos said that sometimes using a filter, it will be interesting to know with or without filter what happened in the OR. So maybe protection as you see here uh, will be the basic, uh, um, uh, the basic thing to be done. And in fact, there was a, a, the, when we restart surgery, uh, look what happened using a filter. And this is what happened with my screen shell after the surgery. So you can see the drops of blood in my mask. So that means that in the past, that was, was coming to my eyes or were coming somewhere else. So, so that means that even using a filters, it seems that the most important thing will be the protection. So uh, uh, how do you uh, protect yourself? Let's start the other That's way around. Salary, it, 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 it's a very, your mask is very fascinating because it's a real challenge, isn't it? Because the question I have is, did you get the blood because you couldn't see what you were doing or because it was protecting you? And I think we started operating with glasses and the visors and then we get fogged up, we can't see. And most of us have now moved to, if we're wearing glasses, we wear a good mask and we, we we're, we're happier that way because it is a challenge, isn't it? Doing a complex operation for several hours with a visor on that gets fogged up and you can't see. That, that's right. That's the problem, the fog. So and that's the reason what I mean. I mean, it's, it, everybody is easy to write, use a glass. But if not, you, you're not used to that, it gets foggy and you get crazy during the surgery. I don't know if that happened to Dr. Chukra and Dr. Velovic also. Well, um... I analyzed the, 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 the available literature about uh, the, the uh, uh, barriers to using uh, PPE. Uh, and I found that there are four most often cited reasons. Lack of time, which is, well, uh, the, the, the worst possible reason. Then sometimes PPE is not available when needed. And in the beginning of the pandemic, it was the case. Uh, again, in the peak of pandemic, it could be the case again. Then uh, perception this, that, that the use of PP interferes with ability to perform the job. And that's exactly Salva what, what you said and, and Tom as well. And there is one reason that we did not mention, which is to my point of view important, it's significant physical discomfort, and uh, in addition, uh, difficulty communicating, communicating to, to, to uh, colleagues and nurses when you're wearing respirator or full face shield or visor. Means it's not easy. The obstacles are significant and we will see what will happen with, with the, the, the protection equipment. Yep, I don't know if you'd like to add something, Dr. Chukra. Uh, we, we use uh, uh, by mandate uh, N95 masks and uh, surgical masks over them and, and face shields. Uh, 
uh, we use them by method. If, if you want to use goggles instead and you have your own goggles, you can use them. Uh, and I think it's important. This, this is uh, really uh, an, an important issue. Although it's, it's uh, very cumbersome sometimes, I use uh, respirators, the half face uh, masks of 3M with P3 filters. And, and uh, I have a loud voice, but I still uh, cannot communicate anything of what I'm saying to my uh, scrub nurse or my assistant. And I have to shout uh, really uh, uh, loud to, for them to, uh, to hear anything and understand me. So it, it's really uh, a challenge and it is very uncomfortable. It's really yep. very uncomfortable. I, I have to, yeah, there is. Hours. There is in the QA, there is a, 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 a statement saying that surgeons have reported since using a smoke evacuation, they, they don't, no, no longer have a smoke particle in their own sputum or nasal markers. So maybe the conclusion that we can face here that you have to balance because maybe filters are not going to filter everything, but if you decrease the load of virus and particles in the ambience and you use the N95 mask, uh, that will help for sure. So balance between using a smoke evacuation, you're going to reduce the load of problems in the OR or particles in the OR. And at the same time, use PPI at the level in which you still feel comfortable to operate and to give uh, a good quality of surgery to the patient. I think, uh, I think, I think that will be- very, very nice approach, yeah. This is a very will... logic and very nice approach. Yeah. And, and so if we keep moving in that sense, we can see that also there are some other issues to, to take into consideration. We've been talking about open access instead of better needle to control, uh, or avoid open access to avoid uh, leakage, uh, use trockers with balloon at the tip, uh, close the trocker before to, sp to, to start the surgery, make sure that you close so not doing at the end when there are more particles. Uh, also, there will be some recommendation about uh, how to remove the specimen, the, the, spe the, the specimen, how to use the pneumoperitoneal, low uh, level of pneumoperitoneal and the type of energy. Yes, uh, we have to go fast in the answer. So have you changed in terms of trocar, pneumoperitoneal, remove a space, uh, a specimen or energy? Have you changed in your practice any of these uh, issues, uh, just if it's no, just say no. So let's start the other way around. Uh, Dr. Chukri. No, I, I haven't changed anything of what I used to do. I'm doing everything the same way. Uh, Milos? Well, we are, we are trying to, to control uh, evacuation of, of pneumoperitoneal. Means that we are trying to, uh, to uh, evacuate the pneumoperitoneum through the filter when it's possible. The other possibility is laparoscopic suction. When you yep. want to exufflate the gas, nothing more than that. You too, Tom, have you seen anything in your practice? No, uh, and, and we always took care with removing our pneumoperitoneum for oncology and comfort reasons for the patient. So we, 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 we haven't changed anything, no. What I've noticed around me, the people are using filter, people are using the mask, and people are, instead of removing the gas, open the truck, are you, uh, uh, suction the tr the the omoperitoneal now that is the main difference that I'm observing around me in the different groups in my hospital. So there is a little bit of change, and again the message will be balance balance between uh, aerosol production in the OR and balance with your protection and find the right uh, situation to work and give the the patient the perfect uh, what they really need. But let's go to pulling question number three. Um, so. Who is eligible for laparoscopic surgery during COVID-19? All patients, uh, non-COVID patients, or you really think that you, if you test a patient, you find a real COVID patient, uh, you avoid laparoscopy. So what is your opinion in that sense? Can I start? Yeah, let's, let's, see, let's see the answer. Okay. So 
uh, basically, um, there is half who say to everybody and half of the, the, the attendees say that in COVID patient, they will not perform a laparoscopic uh, surgery. So that's a question for you. Uh, would you perform a, a laparoscopic surgery in a COVID patient? Uh, you were going to, to start, Dr. Chukri. Well, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's not uh, that simple because you need to... Uh, uh, to see what you're dealing with. Uh, if you are talking about a situation like uh, my center, for example, we have uh, all elective cases and uh, we don't have any emergency patients. And, and we can postpone any patient for a couple of weeks if we uh, find that they are uh, COVID positive or suspected to be COVID positive. But the problem, the real problem is uh, what about uh, emergency cases? If you have a, an emergency case and the patient is a known COVID, would you deny uh, the patient to, uh, to have a laparoscopic procedure? And, and uh, mind you that this COVID patient is, is a potentially very sick patient. So, or, so he can or she can uh, benefit greatly from a minimally invasive procedure uh, if, if they are very sick instead of uh, having an open procedure. So uh, from the discussion that we had uh, for the past hour and the mode of transmission and the risks and uh, all of that, if this, the, the, uh, the general well-being of the patient is, is the most important thing and the patient can uh, tolerate a laparoscopic procedure, I would never uh, say no to a COVID patient that because they are COVID that uh, he will be denied to have a laparoscopic procedure. So you will, uh, will be protecting yourself? Yeah, you should protect yourself, protect your staff and, and the anesthesiologist uh, most of all, but uh, you carry on with the laparoscopic pro procedure as planned. So Tom, Dr. Cecil? I, 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 would, I would agree with that completely that uh, the, the, you need to do what's the right thing for the patient in terms of uh, what, what's going to be the best tool to treat them. I think when you're talking, we have had a lot of COVID patients in our hospital uh, and these patients are often anticoagulated. They can be very sick. There's lots of concerns. And if a laparoscopy is the right thing to get the right information, then we would do it. We take our PP very seriously in these situations. We have a, a, a dedicated theatre for COVID patients uh, and, and we would put in all the things we've talked about and be much more selective about our approach and what we're trying to achieve and damage limitation approach to minimise the risk for everybody. I think you write something important also. It's important to have a COVID, uh, a COVID uh, OR prepared for those patients but you have to offer laparoscopy because of the benefits for the patient. Even you have to protect yourself a little bit, uh, uh, well, uh, not a little bit, so much uh, more than, than in a standard patient. Is, is that your opinion the same, uh, Milos? Definitely, uh, but when patient is COVID positive, it's not only about OR, it's about complete pathway of the patient. Yep, the uh, pathway is important. It be yep. completely different, but uh, I, uh, I agree with all of you. My decision is to proceed with minimal invasive surgery during these pandemics, utilizing individual risk assessment and a bit more liberal conversion to open surgery when needed. Nothing more than that. Okay, so, um, and then this, uh, this is a situation that we can find. You know that, uh, that this slide that have been around uh, worldwide about the uh, COVID patient, that 30% of COVID patients are uh, have no symptoms, so are difficult to identify. So my question will be, we decide to operate, and I, will, I would like to talk not uh, about emergency patients. I will talk to, to talk about elective patients. So my question will be, since there is a 30% of patients um, that are asymptomatic and you're not, it's difficult to identify them, uh, even that you go, you ask them uh, if they have like a, uh, loss of uh, smelling or, or, or flavor because one of the signs that you identify, you really do a clinical history of the patient very well. How do you screen the patient for elective surgery? So Tom, let's go uh, this time from your side. How do you, 
how do you do it? How do you do it during the peak and how do you do it now? So, so we, we have some questionnaires we used about have they had exposure, risk, symptoms, which we've been using in the outpatient setting to assess things. We, we also, for patients who are coming in for surgery, we ask them to self-isolate for two weeks. And then we would do a COVID swab. And we have been doing CT chest after often they've needed restaging for their cancer. So we have been doing CTs of their chest, but now uh, we've stopped that. Although we're quite keen on that for people having major surgery still. And often they need it for their cancer staging if they've had their surgery delayed. Because I think it's nice to know their, their chest is okay. We've had one patient who got a very nasty post-operative pneumonia, which has turned out not to be COVID. Uh, and we did, and it was useful to have her CT chest before to know that it looked okay. So basically you recommend, um, if you don't have the swaps to do a CT scan of the thorac or thoracic CT scan of the chest, uh, in case, um, um, but if you have the possibility of doing a nasal swap, go for a nasal swap to all oncological patients, right, Tom? Yeah, we, we, we would recommend a nasal swab 48 hours before. Okay. Uh, Milos, what are you doing in Serbia? In, in Serbia, we suggest our patients to uh, stay at home in self-isolation for two weeks before admission to the hospital. Then testing within 72 hours of hospital admission using PCR test. Uh, we are asking for the full blood count to, to see the uh, lymphocyte level because in up to 50% of cases, COVID positive cases, we can find lymphocytopenia. Uh, and we are asking for the chest X-ray. We know that uh, sensitiveness of the chest X-ray is, is lower than, than CT, but it, the availability of the chest X-ray is, is better. Then at the admission, we do epidemiological data check and clinical examination. And during the hospital stay, we implement closing the back door strategy. That's it. Okay, and you, Dr. Chakri, how are you doing in your center? We, we uh, don't have the luxury of uh, swabs. Uh, swabs are very, very uh, limited in uh, our country. And it is uh, only in uh, COVID-dedicated hospitals uh, for, for COVID patients and, and patients recovering from COVID. So we don't, we cannot do swabs, but we do uh, a very uh, thorough uh, clinical uh, history, and, and uh, uh, we do the labs. And in any uh, suspicion of uh, any, any possible. Uh, COVID symptoms or uh, abnormalities in the lab, we do CT chests uh, immediately and, and uh, especially in the perioperative period, 48 hours before the surgery. Uh, the, the issue of self-isolation at home is very difficult in Egypt because uh, we have a very large per percentage of the population in overcrowded uh, housings. So it, it's, it's really an impossibility to ask the, the, the patient to self-isolate because it, that, there is no way he would self-isolate. So we rely really on epidemiology of the, of the patient, on, uh, on the history, on being uh, totally uh, asymptomatic and all the labs and uh, at any doubt we do CT chests immediately. Okay, so, so I could oh, summarize. Yeah, one one yeah, minute, please, more. Uh, just just one uh, thing about PCRs, the swaps. I mean, the, that's important to, to emphasize that that uh, sensitivity of different uh, swaps, different PCR tests is quite different. It ranges from 60 to 85%, really. And uh, it seems that negative PCR, negative swab test does not mean that there is no infection. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in low rated PCRs swaps, uh, the sensitivity is only 60%, which means that uh, in the case that we are in the possibility to, uh, in chance to do the test, we have to correlate the test result with clinical examination, laboratory data, and specially imaging procedure like CT scan when we can do it.
Yeah, I, just to point out, you're right, Milos, and, and it's important to send that message that is important, the, the, the importance of the epidemiological and the clinical history of the patient, because that gives you so many signs and, and you can move from 60% of the sensitivity to 98% in some centers. So because they, how you uh, uh, take the, 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 the test, how you do the test uh, have an importance in that sense, but it's true not in all the centers have the possibility to have the nasal swaps. And that's the reason why what I include uh, here in, in the presentation is to give, because we are having data, uh, this paper from, from the COVID search in which, I'm sorry, the COVID search in which you see how important it is maybe for us to know exactly how to test the patient. And um, these are the patients in which the mortality uh, rate is higher if you operate uh, them during the pandemic. So it's important to identify this patient and to be a little bit more focused on this patient to do a swap or a CT scan. And this comes from the paper uh, published in Lancet by the COVID search group. Um, so I don't know uh, if you, uh, and I'm going to move because we're talking about oncological patient and these, I bring it here because it's important to link it to this question. Um, how do you do, uh, uh, do you do any different for oncological patients? Number one, do be, um, in, or no, not all oncological patients are the same. Um, do you uh, change in terms of if you have a major procedure with a major, uh, a major procedure, you change your testing, your indication of minimal invasive surgery? Uh, what do you do? Uh, let's go, uh, Milos, let's start with you this time. Um. <laughs> Generally speaking, uh, I work uh, in a busy uh, department for, for minimal invasive surgery. And in a regular situation, we do more than 80% of esophagectomies for cancer minimal invasively, called minimal invasive esophagectomy. And more than 70% of cases of a gastrectomy using laparoscopic subtotal or total gastrectomy. And we did not change anything. Okay, I mean, that's good to know. One, as, as a matter of fact, to change one thing, uh, we uh, make conversion a bit earlier when, when we have to do it. And I, I will point out something. Did you defer um, the chemo, uh, the surgery by adding some cycle of chemotherapy if you are in the peak in those difficult patients of total gastrectomy or esophagectomy? Well, uh, we are not allowed to... Uh, to uh, uh, send patients to additional protocols of chemotherapy because we have strict protocols. Okay. Then we admit patients to the hospital and they're waiting for surgery. Because there was some recommendation coming from Sun Society telling yes, that, I in fact, yesterday I, I did an esophagectomy in a patient that came to us right in the peak in April, and we decided to give an extra, uh, an extra cycle of chemotherapy, and we operated on him uh, uh, yesterday, and we could do the procedure without any problem. And we are happy that we did that in that case. But I think the multidisciplinary, it has to be a multidisciplinary decision. What do yes. you do, Tom, in your center? Well, I, I, I would agree with that. And I think the multidisciplinary opinion has to include the patient. Yeah. And, and, and we, as I explained, we had to stop operating for six weeks. And so we use that time to speak to all our patients and ask them about things. And some patients were keen to come for surgery when they could. Other patients wanted to wait a bit longer because they've been more frightened of, of, of COVID. We have had some patients, we've had two patients who unfortunately have progressed with their cancer and became inoperable when we rescanned them. But then that whether in that period that would have happened, whether they would have got their lung and liver metastases, in any case, it's always very hard to know whether a delay of two or three months makes that difference. Um, but I, I think it is a challenge. Our, our cancer patients are often elderly. They often have elderly relatives. We had to have discussions about the fact that we stopped all visitors. Uh, and now, now patients can have visitors, but they were coming alone for their operation and the, 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 they weren't allowed visitors in the hospitals. We were trying to keep the, our, our green areas as COVID free as possible. So there, were, there are challenges. Yeah, Dr. Chukra in your center. Well, uh, when started uh, the pandemic and, and all the uh, guidelines started to pop up from every uh, society, I was really uh, amazed about uh, a lot of uh, things in, in the guidelines. 
if, if you have a patient who is straightforward for surgery, why should you send them to uh, receive chemotherapy? Uh, instead, you have absolutely no guarantee that during the time of receiving chemotherapy, the patient will do well and can uh, progress his disease uh, during the, uh, the time of the chemotherapy. But it makes sense if, if the, the question of, of giving chemotherapy is optional, you, uh, it, it, uh, it is indicated uh, you, you can give the patient uh, chemotherapy uh, in a neoadjuvant setting to delay the surgery, avoid the peak, avoid the uh, pressure on the healthcare system. This can uh, have a, a rationale. So I think really it, it needs to be tailored uh, to every patient. It needs to be very, very selective, very selective because you are moving on, on a very thin ice here uh, because sometimes the, the, the decision to delay the patient's surgery uh, in favor of uh, receiving chemotherapy is, is uh, not for the best benefit of the patient. So, so uh, it, it's really a, a very delicate balance between uh, all, all, every aspect, the healthcare uh, facility, uh, pressure, the peak, uh, the, the status of the patient, the, uh, the, the diagnosis, the disease itself, the pathology itself. So uh, I would not, by choice, uh, channel the patient to receive uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy instead of having surgery just because of the uh, fact that, uh, that there is a pandemic. But if, if, you, if you can operate and, and the situation in the, I mean, uh, Tom, for example, in, in, in England, they stopped surgery altogether. So you, you cannot, you, uh, there is no option. You, you cannot operate on anybody. So uh, these patients should be channeled. But you, uh, as, as a general idea to channel the patient to receive chemotherapy, while in the normal circumstances you would have operated, I don't think this is a very wise thing to do. Yeah, I think, I think it's important what you mentioned, multidisciplinary approach, include the patient in the decision, I think is, is very important. Okay, if it's something like in Madrid and Barcelona, there were some center during the peak that there was no surgery at all because there was nothing, uh, there was a, even the OR, were occupied by, by COVID positive patient intubated in the OR. So there was no chance. There was only one OR for uh, emergencies. So, so of course you have to decide based on, on what is going on in the environment. As Tom said at the beginning with that slide, the environment, what's going on in your center. But it is true that oncological patient, you should proceed with your minimal invasive and your standard care. But uh, if you're in the peak, uh, you could evaluate to neoadjuvant uh, uh, therapy, but decided in a multidisciplinary setting and including the patient in the decision. But let's go to the other side because there is a question. Sometimes uh, you want to operate the patient, but the patient is scared. And they said, no, they're not going to the operating room. So how do you encourage the patient to come and tell them we are in a safe area? How you can guarantee that? Do you have any problem? Because when we restart surgery in our setting, 20% of our patients say, no, they were going to wait. Uh, even oncological patients. So uh, to start again the other way around, so Dr. Shukri, uh, what happened uh, in your center in that sense? Do you have problem in that sense? Yeah, uh, well, uh, everybody was scared at the beginning, uh, to, even to come to the hospital, uh, not to, to be operated. To, uh, they do not want to get, to get into the hospital to start with. And uh, the people started to miss their appointments and uh, all of that. But uh, we really have to reach for them and, and uh, discuss with them and, and explain very thoroughly that uh, we are uh, a tertiary care center. We do not deal with COVID patients at all. And we do our best to keep the hospital COVID free. And we screen everybody, even the personnel of the uh, hospital themselves if, if anybody shows symptoms they are, uh, are isolated at home and and uh, we have a, a very protected environment so you can come in and have your surgery because it is important not to delay your surgery this is your treatment you have a very uh, serious diagnosis you cannot play with it time is very important and if they were afraid and eligible for 
neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And these are the people that I would channel to uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Because and do you, do this you is upon their own request in a multidisciplinary setting, of course. And so, uh, telemedicine the, to explain that to the patient? Do you use telemedicine to explain that to the patient? Uh, telemedicine, tele uh, consulting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we used everything. Uh, we used uh, WhatsApp, phone calls, uh, telemedicine. Uh, and, and if they're uh, coming to the outpatient clinic, of course, this would be much easier. But we, we had, we had uh, some, I, I cannot say it was a big problem because uh, cancer is a, is a serious diagnosis and people, uh, when, when they are faced with the diagnosis of cancer, they tend to uh, be a little bit uh, apprehended and they want to uh, get it over with uh, their treatment. Uh, but you, you, I, you will uh, find it very obvious, for example, if you, if, if you operated the patient uh, for a very low rectal cancer and did an ileostomy and the patient should uh, come for closure and they never show up and uh, they will keep delaying, delaying, and we advise them to delay. So uh, in, in this setting, it, it has become uh, an elective procedure that can be done any, any time. So it, it's uh, at the patient's leisure. So uh, we, we can delay it. So it's not a big, really big percentage, and, and it was not a big problem for us. But uh, some patients did uh, fear to come to the hospital. So Milos, did you have to face that problem uh, to encourage not the really. patient to come? Uh, oh. Not really, because we are, we are at the moment we are the only center for for elective upper GI surgery, oncological surgery in the country. With seven million people, we have okay. opposite problem. But anyway, uh, we, we use electronic media more and more. We used it more even before pandemics, but during the pandemics, we use it lot. like three times more than, than, than we used to use it before the pandemics. We have a lot of uh, talk via the, the WhatsApp, Viber. Uh, we receive documentation via the mail or, or, or some, some other um, uh, application by the phone. And, and we, talk more and more with, with uh, patients and the family using the, the, the distance talking. And you, Tom, how did you face the situation? I, I think for us, it was more of a problem. And again, it was very, we did a lot of um, uh, 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 tele uh, outpatients, teleconferencing with our patients to have these discussions about what we should do. I think we were very nervous in the beginning because we weren't sure how the, the, how protected the patients would be. I can say that in the post-operative period, we've only had one patient who's become COVID positive, and she was an inpatient before we shut down uh, from, from February, and all the other patients have been fine. So I think we can now reassure them if they're in our green areas, they're very unlikely to get COVID. And I think probably our fear of the consequences post-op, I think our... Our intensive care doctors are more confident on treating patients should they get COVID. You know that the steroids is having a big effect and, and outcomes are better. So I think we are able to reassure patients more that they're likely to be okay. Okay, I have another question for you. Uh, it's because now we have to balance. Okay, we, we test the patient, we decide to go ahead, operate them. But how do you balance the early discharge with the readmissions in minimal invasive surgery. So how much, how much you went into the ERAS protocol in terms of saying, well, uh, it's interesting to have the patient as uh, as, as, as few days as possible to avoid uh, um, no, uh, uh, a contamination inside the hospital and send it home. And how do you balance that with readmission rate? Do you have to face that? Um, let's go for Milos this time. That's the first uh, one. Well, uh, we are basically talking about ERAS protocol. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we all know that, that, that ERAS is introduced in all surgical disciplines uh, to decrease morbidity, especially non-surgical morbidity, length of stay in the hospital and patient satisfaction. Uh, and we implemented ERAS protocol in both esophageal and, 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 and gastric cancer and, and non-cancer surgery. 
but uh, and and I truly believe that minimally invasive surgery is probably center part of ERES, but uh, just a part of big puzzle. Uh, I, I see the, the ERES protocol as a big puzzle uh, and multidisciplinary protocol that should be a standard of care in modern high volume surgical centers. But when to when you want to change a, a piece in a puzzle, you should be very careful not to turn down the puzzle into pieces. Uh, and I think the change should be well planned in advance and should be made one step at a time. And when you do the change, you have to monitor and correlate process with the end results. And in the time of crisis, uh, I pers personally prefer to practice routine and avoid forced changes to avoid turbulence in the system, which is already significantly affected by the COVID uh, in this month. To cut long story short, uh, I would change routine in the time of crisis only if I have to do it. Otherwise, I will practice everything that I've practiced before. This com comes, you mean, uh, repeatedly the, the fact that, that you shouldn't change the way you do things. Uh, because if you change the way you do things, um, you, uh, you can fail and have some, uh, even create more problems. What do you think, Tom? And, ba and basically, that's the basic of the idea of an ERAS protocol, you do the same all the time. Uh, not the fact of the patient going home earlier, is the fact that if you do the things in the proper way, there is less possibility of, of mistake. Right, Tom? I would say that ERAS has never been easier. The patients really want to go home. Uh, and if anything, it, it's sometimes just saying, can we just have another day to make sure? Because the worry if it is getting back, back in sometimes. We have a a difficult system whereby if you've not isolated, you can't go to the green area. So if you become an emerge, you come in through the amber areas. So that there, there is some challenges. And one of the other challenges we faced was at the beginning, all our nurse specialists who help a lot with our ERAS program got taken in, into the intensive care and the COVID wards. So we lost a lot of our nurses who are often the point of contact who will follow the patients up and provide that support at home. So there were some challenges, but on the whole, patients have been very keen to get out of hospital. Yeah. Uh, what happened in Egypt, uh, Dr. Shukran? Well, uh, in, in our center, uh, we practice ERAS for, uh, as a routine uh, practice uh, years ago. So uh, I, I cannot say that we have changed much. Uh, if if uh, the patient is, is uh, doing well and uh, we can discharge him a day earlier or so, it's, uh, it's possible. But the, the, the whole idea is, uh, is intriguing because I was uh, uh, in Sage's uh, colorectal collaborative group. There was a, a surgeon in, in the U.S. Uh, in, uh, practicing in New York, he was uh, he placed a, a, a post uh, in, in that group that uh, they started discharging patients uh, from the recovery room, uh, colectomy patients from the recovery room uh, directly home because the patients were too scared to stay in the hospital. But uh, th this is, I, I think, this is a very very aggressive way of uh, handling. Uh, the situation uh, and and it can backfire uh, in the system as uh, Milo said if, if uh, you start having uh, half of your patients that you discharge coming back again uh, as emergency patients or uh, going into uh, uh, emergency room uh, at the middle of the night with the uh, uh, other other potentially COVID patients uh, you, you will have backfired and, and uh, did bad to the patient, not not uh, not a good thing. So I think it's it's uh, as we talked uh, uh, now and again about balance. It's a balance. So we can push a little bit things earlier, uh, and and uh, at the same time you do not risk of uh, having uh, an increased readmission rate and complication rate. And the okay. thing is, in, in Egypt, we don't have the, the structured uh, program of uh, following the patients at home. Okay. This is not, uh, this, That's this important. Is, uh, 
this is not very easy for us. So uh, to keep the patient uh, with us uh, for uh, one or two more extra days is, is better than uh, having problems uh, at home and we cannot reach the patient easily. So I, I, we have one minute left and we have to answer three questions that we just raised. So just say yes, no, or the way you do it. Advice to do lap cholesterol and lap appendectomy, yes, no, uh, cholecystectomy and, and appendectomy by laparoscopy, Tom? Yeah, yes. sure. For sure, yes. that's right. Uh, there was a question coming to the chat and I said, of course, go for it. Oncological okay. patients by oncologist, yes. Yes, yes. with consent. Uh, but for minimal invasive, no doubts about. Uh, I think it was clear, multidisciplinary decisions, uh, don't change your practice, protect yourself, filters could decrease the load of, num of, of, of virus and particle in the OR. Next question, did the hospital test the surgical team? Tom, yes, no, how they did it? Uh, not really, a little bit, a not little enough. Bit. Translate, PCR, serology? Uh, we've, had, we've had serology. Okay, Milos? Nothing really. Nothing, Hamed? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing. okay. How many people do you think die being non COVID because they didn't come to the hospital? Do you think that happened? Yes. No one knows. I, I can say from the cardiologist that there was a lot of people with cardiac problems that didn't come to the hospital and, and came very late. That's, that's as far as I know. So if that happened, uh, that also uh, could happen in, in other procedures. A, 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 lot of things, a lot of information will come later on when yeah. things. There may be some patients who didn't die because they didn't come to the hospital too. Yeah, okay, so no harm as well. So just to tell you that I, I hope that um, you saw this was published in 2017. This is Asterix and Obelix that they beat someone that was really bad, that was a coronavirus and they beat it. So I hope that also as a study, a, a, Asterix and Obelix did it in, in 2017. We can do it in this, uh, during this year. Hopefully we will, we will do it. But think that we have to join our mind uh, to work uh, hard to defeat the coronavirus and surgeons have an important role in this situation. So I don't know if you want to finish with some advice, very quick, just uh, uh, 30 seconds each. Milos? Well, um... It's important to emphasize that this pandemic will not come to an end soon. We know from, from the recent studies that, that uh, IgG level in population is relatively low. It can be due to the self-isolation uh, of the part of the population, but uh, due to the low production of the IgG as well as a consequence of infection or after the infection, which means that it's not likely that that pandemic will come to an end soon, and we have to be prepared for the long fight. Uh, Dr. Shukrik? Well, uh, yes, this pandemic is not going anywhere uh, soon, and, and uh, we might uh, learn how to live with it. And it's not just this pandemic. What, what, uh, what if next year there is another virus, and the year after there is another virus? It's, it's, uh, th this is a, a wake up call for us to uh, change uh, our mindset, to be able to be flexible, to deal with all these uh, healthcare challenges and keep our uh, practice uh, safe and, and uh, effective uh, for, uh, for every situation. Tom? message to the people i would just say to remember to mention covid on your consent forms and and, and in the discussion with patients and document that because because it does remain a risk yep uh, hopefully i don't know if the world and the those who rules the world uh get the message from the from nature about how things goes and how they they have um they have to invest effort and money for the future uh, to, to live in a better world. So hopefully they learn this message, we don't know. And in the meantime, I think it's important to follow the rules, maintain the physical distance, mask, 
and, and as a surgeon continue doing what we know how to do it, uh, is operating our patient in the proper way and, and protect the patients and protect ourselves and give the best for the patient. So thank you everybody. Thank you, the three panelists. Excellent cool. job, very well. I enjoy very much discussing with you. I hope we have an important message uh, uh, to the audience. And I don't know, Nitya, if you want to finish uh, with some words. Sure, sure, uh, Dr. Morales. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to Tom, um, Prof. Milos, and Dr. Shukri. Um, it's, it's, it was very interesting topics and a lot of good discussion. Um, so with that, I um, just wanted to say thanks a million from our side. Uh, we are all now a lot more uh, understanding that MIS is possible and in a safe way. Um, with that, uh, thank you to all the participants attending. Um, we will send out a short survey after the call uh, just to make sure that we understand some future topics that you will be interested in. Um, with that, have a wonderful day and, and thanks to the moderator and the panelists and everyone attending. Have a good day. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Are we off? Yeah. Okay.